plume. Ok. Donc on va les interpréter derrière. Ok, c'est le. La... Not only um, for our students here at London Met, but also for the world of interpreters. We are delighted to be with you here today, uh, Mikalina. This is your room, it bears your name. And we chose to call this new interpreting suite Mika, the Mikalina Ageros Interpreting Suite. This was quite important to us because yourself, you embody quite a long story um, which started quite a long time ago. So I know that we are going to hear the very beginning of your story with your departure from Poland, your journey across Europe. Uh, we're going to hear how you started school in France as well, and how then later on you engaged in the profession of interpreting. We are also going to hear about the beginnings of the International um, Association of Conference Interpreters. So can you see how much you embody just yourself? Uh, as we said at the beginning, before we started today, we would have loved to speak French together, uh, because we normally speak French, but we are in the UK, um, and hopefully we hope that um, the viewers uh, who are going to look at this video will understand what we say, and English seems to be the lingua franca nowadays, even though behind us in the booths we have interpreters. And this is what it's all about today. It's about interpreting. So today, actually, we've got our students from the MA Conference Interpreting who are practicing their interpreting. And what we are saying in English is interpreted into Italian, uh, into Spanish, into Polish, uh, of course, your language, into Chinese and into uh, Spanish. I think I've already mentioned Spanish. So, Michel, um, I'm going to give you the floor, and I would love to hear how it all started. And I'm saying this started when you were a little girl, right? Thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, I have to thank you for providing me with this opportunity, and I also want to thank the students who will be interpreting my words into various languages. Uh, I should speak English, if only because, as Daniel rightly said, it is the lingua franca. And uh, I shall start at the beginning. Well, actually, I shall start uh, how I got to the university here on the underground today. And I looked at an advert in one of the stations. I don't remember the words exactly, but it said something like, if you are born in one country and grew up in another and now live somewhere else quite different, it must be difficult for you to answer the question, where are you from? A question which in England is often asked when one's English is slightly foreign. Well, I thought about that. I should know the answer because, of course, I was born in Poland. Uh, I grew up and was educated in France. And I have lived in the UK uh, since, well, the late 50s. But uh, we all know where we come from, really. So it's really the wrong question, isn't it? As a question is, why were we moving all the time? Most of us, it's not through choice, rather through necessity and that was true of me, of course, the war. Uh, but it is true of my generation of interpreters, uh, many of whom were uh, refugees, stateless, displaced persons, whatever you want to call them. But they certainly uh, did not decide to have such eventful lives. So the beginning of events, it's, of course, 1939 for me, uh, the war. Uh, and uh, 
the invasion of Poland, which was from the West. And so people got on the move. People started fleeing. And they were logically going east. Uh, what they didn't realize, it's strange now, because now we get information all the time, true or false, but we get it. In those days, people didn't know that there had been a pact between uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. And in that pact, uh, it was decreed that Poland would disappear, uh, that it would be divided between those uh, neighboring powers. It confirms uh, what one of Queen Victoria's ministers, Lord Palmerston, said. Nations have no friends, they have no enemies, they just have interests. Mm. Well, it was in the best interest of those powers that Poland should disappear, and people were right to be frightened. Although uh, they were probably quite wrong in where they were moving to, moving east. We moved by we, I mean my family, mother, grandmother, and a child myself. Uh, father, of course, being in the army and on the front. So we moved first by car, then horse and cart, and we got to the Hungarian border. Uh, Hungary was not a democracy in those days, but it was a welcoming country. Uh, so we crossed the border and got on a train to Budapest, and the kind gentleman uh, paid for our tickets because, of course, we had no currency. And so um, I discovered at that age, I was seven. I discovered that um, some foreigners are kind, that they speak strange languages one doesn't understand, uh, that it's very useful to have money, uh, lots of useful discoveries like that. Uh, and uh, once in Budapest, I also discovered that when you are uh, a refugee, uh, you should turn to the Red Cross. As a Red Cross, as a source of information, uh, advised that uh, the regiment uh, in which my father served uh, had got out of Poland into Romania and was about to be transferred to France. And so uh, we went to join him in France. And I remember the journey, uh, snowy Yugoslavia, sunny Italy, cold Switzerland. Uh, so I've mentioned a few cliches, but uh, that's logical, because cliches are exactly expressions of how children see the world. Uh, so we are by now um, in sort of late October, 39. We are in Paris. Um, Everybody speaks French, uh, just about, except in our household where one spoke Polish. And so uh, I was, for the first time in my life, sent to school, a uh, French school, a state school, of course, a girls' school. Those were the days of girls' schools. Um, and uh, in that school, people spoke French, logically. Uh, there was one uh, girl who had arrived a year earlier from uh, what was then Czechoslovakia, uh, for the same reasons for which I had arrived. Uh, we could communicate between Czech and Polish just a bit. And anyway, uh, children, when they need to, are just like little sponges. They just absorb languages. So uh, by the beginning of the Christmas vacation, uh, I was managing with French, and I had acquired a new name. I had become Michel. Uh, the school had decided uh, that all foreign names would be totally exotic and unpronounceable, uh, but kindly, they gave me a choice between uh, 
Micheline and Michelle, and I thought Micheline sounded like tires. Uh, I think there are still tires, Les uh, Michelin. Surely two words in French are allowed. Uh, anyway, uh, so I was not to be Micheline, and I was given even more choice whether I wanted two L's or an accent on Michelle. And obviously, since we had no such accent in Polish, I thought that would be much more French and more suitable. I've lived to regret it once I came to England, especially after the Beatles made uh, Michel with two L's so popular. Anyway, it was too late to mend. So um, that's about 39, but we get to 1940, a sad year for France, a sad year for the world. Uh, and uh, things are back as they were before. I mean, father is on the front, uh, namely on the border between uh, France and, 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 and Germany. You know, that border that could not be crossed uh, because it had been so well uh, fortified, uh, but uh, one could go around it. Uh, so the military chiefs had not thought about it. Uh, pity. Uh, anyway, so um, father was there and that ended uh, badly five years in a prisoner of war camp. And we, uh, the rest of the family, well, we were uh, fleeing again, or at least we were moving. Uh, this time we were moving south. And we got to a border. We got as far as the Spanish border. Uh, it was uh, Franco Spain. So, of course, in order to cross it, uh, one had to be a millionaire. Uh, millionaires did, we didn't. We were stuck in France. Uh, Basically, um, on the Riviera, because the climate is nice, and because it wasn't yet occupied. We were in Nice. Uh, that lasted three years. In Nice, I went to school. Uh, uh, we were, for a while, a short while, occupied by the Italian army. Uh, the natives in Nice rather welcomed uh, the soldiers, like like relatives, well, probably some of them were relatives, uh, and uh, that occupation didn't bother us at all. We just had to renew residence permits every month. Uh, but by 1943, it was a German occupation, and the residence permits were not renewed. It was thought that. Uh, refugees, foreigners, could somehow help if American or British troops landed from Africa across the Med. Uh, we certainly wish them to, but I don't see how we could have helped them. Anyway, uh, so we had to move to central France, a small town, uh, or too peaceful uh, for any occupying forces to be there. Uh, it was just fine, except that there was no secondary school for girls, uh, not for boys either. Uh, there were just a few French refugees from uh, occupied France uh, who were teachers and gave occasion occasional uh, lessons. Uh, I discovered uh, then uh, that uh, if you don't have formal tuition, if you just... Uh, study whatever you enjoy, uh, it makes life uh, much more pleasant. Uh, so I just uh, ditched math and sciences and uh, focused on the classics. Uh, and uh, I kind of believed that languages would be all right. Uh, I still thought of them as a kind of infectious diseases. Uh, you just catch them like flu. Uh, and in later years, uh, it worked pretty well with Portuguese when I was uh, uh, in Brazil. Uh, doesn't work in, with English. It's a harder nut to crack. Uh, perhaps I should have mentioned that my unorthodox approach to education 
uh, worked quite well uh, insofar as I got through uh, the baccalaureate, the end of secondary exams, which opens the way to university. Maybe uh, that worked because uh, girls at that time were not really expected to turn towards the sciences and the classics was appropriate. Be that as it may, it worked and I started uh, reading law, which uh, I eventually uh, completed. Uh, so that was that. That was fine. Uh, that dealt with education. Uh. I've, got a, I've got a question for you, Michel. I mean, nowadays we've got the internet, we've got so many facilities to learn, but from what I understand, you were on the move all the time. Um, you studied by yourself. How many years did you study by yourself and how did you have access to, to books and did you have a room to study in? What was it like to study by yourself? Uh, studying by yourself is fine uh, if you um, have minimal facilities. Uh, we lived uh, in hotels, mostly, uh, rather modest hotels, uh, and we usually shared a room, the three of us, and um, of course one was not allowed to... Uh, uh, cook in those rooms but but one did uh, on little spirit lamps and one could uh, well eat and cook and and wash up uh, it it was all managed very well and uh, if one sits quietly in a corner uh, with a book on one's knees that's fine uh, and background talk uh, in polish didn't disturb the studying in in French. In fact, it was quite a good preparation to a, a future multilingual environment. Uh, it, it facilitates a switching off what you don't need to hear, focusing on what you want to hear or what you want to say. So as far as my interpreting future, uh, is that was not a bad preparation for it. So I will come to it a little later. But perhaps I should come to it now, why not? Uh, I did actually eventually uh, study interpreting, uh, but that uh, was later, much later. So uh, I've been speaking about myself a lot, uh, and it was all focused on the war and on the supply of interpreters uh, of my generation through the war, since so many of them had kind of trajectories a bit like mine. But I should now say, and it's true, it's certainly true, that conference interpreting is also the product of war, but of the First World War. Uh, this is not to say that there had been no interpreters before. There must have been. Uh, in border areas, there must have been people who helped those who uh, spoke different or slightly different languages uh, to communicate. Uh, well, there must have been interpreters, but uh, who they were, we don't know. Uh, and there's a contrast there between interpreting and translation, because translators, early translators, are. Uh, uh, say from the Latin uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, say between all languages after the uh, Renaissance, uh, their names are known. Uh, the names of early interpreters are not. Uh, uh, if I'm allowed one short sentence in Latin, uh, uh, well, scripta manent, verba volant. The written word remains, the spoken word flies away, or used to, because now it doesn't. Uh, it's recorded, we are being recorded, I know. But in the past, uh, words were not retained, and, uh, and we don't really uh, know who our early interpreters were. 
So we do know the names of translators. Now uh, we uh, come to a drastic change, uh, which is the product of the First World War. From then on, we know exactly who the interpreters were. They were conference interpreters. And I know this is a familiar story to some, but perhaps not to everybody. We know how it started. It started with, um, in 1917 with one of the more famous uh, figures of conference interpreter, uh, Jean Herbert, who was then an officer in the French army. We are in 1917, and he was asked to help uh, the French finance minister who was trying to secure from Lloyd George, the British government, a loan. Uh, and uh, he has described in writing how uh, he went to Lloyd George's house and how he uh, translated both ways between French and English, uh, a bit sentence by sentence, but gradually it became a form of conference interpreting. And uh, that really is how conference interpreting in consecutive started. Uh, it developed at the end of World War I. There wasn't one peace conference. There were a series of meetings. And uh, we know who the interpreters who worked between French and English were. Uh, we know because because history is written by winners, uh, the losers, uh, the Germans. We assume that military men served as interpreters. Uh, between French and English, well, they were all men, obviously, and none of them trained linguists. Their background uh, was either in law or in economics. And... Uh, Gradually, from very short, condensed versions, it moved to proper consecutive. Uh, after World War I, international organizations, I would probably say intergovernmental, that'd be more correct. Uh, intergovernmental organizations uh, started, the League of Nations, uh, they are... Uh, labor organization. And in them, consecutive was used uh, French and English, the diplomatic languages of the age. Uh, interpreters were either staff members or recruited outsiders, freelancers. Uh, there were no uh, standard uh, employment conditions or remuneration conditions or, uh, or limits on the time uh, spent uh, by each interpreter. It was all uh, negotiable uh, and apparently uh, quite demanding in terms of uh, how many hours uh, an interpreter was to function. Uh, remembering also that uh, speakers in those days were rather more leisurely than they are now, uh, and some apparently actually spoke for an hour uninterrupted, and then uh, the consecutive interpreter uh, took over somehow uh, from uh, records left in writing. It appears that interpreters were much admired for their the skill or for their talents or, or perhaps even for their persistence. Uh, at any rate, uh, they were considered uh, to be artists. Uh, and uh, it is noted, so one isn't quite sure which of uh, the great interpreters actually said that, but apparently a delegate presumed to say, uh, this is not what... I said, and the interpreter replied, no, it is what you ought to have said. Uh, we must confess that sometimes 
in the privacy of the booth, one can think that. But nowadays, one could not possibly uh, say so. Uh, times have changed. Uh, the timing uh, of consecutive, as I'm describing it, was in a sense uh, the golden age of uh, of interpreting, because uh, because the interpreters were participants; they were not just service providers. How that has changed! Uh, we are still in a consecutive world, but in the 1920s. Uh, some rather primitive instruments were devised which allowed for uh, an attempt at simultaneous interpreting. Uh, they were sometimes uh, defined as telephones, uh, and there was talk of uh, telephone interpreting, uh, but sometimes it was described as instant translation. So uh, he wasn't popular with interpreters. Uh, all of them criticized it on a number of grounds, partly simply because the instruments were so primitive, because one could not hear very well, uh, because the transmission wasn't efficient. But it's not just the instruments that were criticized. It was the whole instant formula. and. Um, there is a record of a very experienced uh, interpreter of uh, the League of Nations saying, but with this a telephone interpreting, how can one know what one should omit? Uh, this confirms uh, one of the descriptions or of the criticisms of consecutive, that it was always selective, and that the aim was not so much accuracy as uh, fluency, a fluency with an artistic, appropriate selection of what was essential, uh, rather than the accurate uh, rendering of what one hears, or try to hear, or try to hear. Uh, and it was an effort. And even uh, I am moving in time. Uh, even in the 50s, uh, the quality of sound, the quality of the instruments, uh, left quite a lot to be desired. But uh, much as renowned interpreters disliked simultaneous, they realized that as technology progressed, and it always does, it was bound to become uh, indispensable, necessary, to use uh, instruments and to have simultaneous. The first London Assembly uh, of the United Nations, when Jean Herbert, whom I have mentioned earlier, was head interpreters, uh, was still in consecutive, but there were uh, already many languages, English, uh, French, uh, Russian, Spanish, and Chinese, five, with five languages, apparently. Uh, and one colleague with whom I worked uh, later, uh, who had worked there, told me uh, that uh, in consecutive with five languages, it went on and on and on. Uh, Obviously, the future, sad but true, the future, it was going to be simultaneous. So it's quite interesting to listen to you speak about the technology and how, you know, you were pushed to move forward with new technologies because nowadays, in 2020, we are talking about artificial intelligence, we are talking about remote interpreting, and maybe in the same way that you were at the time, we are a little bit worried, we are a little bit confused, we don't know if we want to move forward or keep tight of what we've got so far. So, But you've been through that period of transition 
And what was it like for you to go through that transition? And what was it like for the interpreters? Well, uh, it's a difficult question to tackle because it depends uh, on a number of variables. The first one is, of course, uh, optimism or pessimism. Uh, and uh, some fear change as some help for it. Uh, those who are in strong privileged positions uh, tend to fear change rather more than those who are not so well established or who are trying to get established. And of course, the former are usually older than the latter, and therefore the young uh, uh, look more favorably on change because they hope that it will enhance their possibilities. And this is true still. It's true again, if you like, when we talk about uh, interpreting uh, entirely online, about artificial intelligence, about all those things which uh, uh, strike older people as rather frightening. Uh, so, uh, it is not fashionable now to be older, and so older people try to show that they are still with it and optimistic and, or at least, cool. Uh, I am very cool about artificial intelligence. I try to read what it will be like. I don't uh, think I will see it or hear it. Uh, or witness it, whatever verb one should use. But uh, it sounds fascinating. Let the young be fascinated. It's easier at their age. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you, when you started your training as an interpreter, it was rather new, wasn't it? And uh, you didn't have all this equipment that we've got here today. So what was it like when you started your training as an interpreter? Well, uh, good. I was, I was going to get there. I, I'm moving slowly over time at a sort of elderly, leisurely uh, rhythm, pace. Uh, you see, basically, uh, I should go back to the recognition, the awareness uh, that interpreting was going to be done in future systematically with different languages uh, with a different method, simultaneous. And so uh, the idea is that it should be taught because there would be a demand and because there would be new skills needed. Uh, teaching interpreting started during, actually, World War II. It started in Geneva in 1941, the first interpreting courses. But really, it started because there were all those people who had worked uh, for international organizations in Geneva and who were by then unemployed. So they had to do something. And, and so they, when people don't know what to do, they usually teach. Uh, well, I'm a case in point. Uh, OK, so they started teaching. Uh, but uh, the crucial year for the teaching of interpreting uh, was really in France uh, in 1953 as a course which I was lucky to be able to attend and to graduate from. Perhaps speaking about Geneva, I ought to have mentioned that when it started in 41, they only taught consecutive. They didn't touch simultaneous. It didn't exist yet. Uh, I think in Geneva, simultaneous started to be taught about 49, quite late. And now, uh, in Paris, a course for conference interpreting was started at the university. In those days, there was only one uh, university in Paris, one and indivisible, like the French Republic, except it got divided later. Anyway, uh, oh, universities proliferated in Paris. In those days, there was one. Uh, it was rather overcrowded. Uh, 
Now, we are not going to talk about the crowding in universities or about student protests or 1968. No, none of that. Simply, there was no room then for additional courses. And so the interpreting course was located in a secondary establishment, um, a lycée, and uh, the course could only take place after the pupils had gone, gone home. So it was starting between sort of five and six uh, and finishing by eight because the building uh, was shut then. And of course, it, it was only on weekdays uh, and, and not during holiday times. Uh, I started uh, about late October and, and finished about April, exams were in May. So it was a short year, not many hours. Uh, we uh, worked in a classroom. Uh, they, uh, there were two teachers. The languages of tuition were two, English and French. One of our teachers was a young interpreter uh, who later made a career in medical interpreting, um, a young Frenchman. The, he did most of the French. And the other one uh, who uh, unfortunately died young and didn't have a long career uh, was from one of the Channel Islands. He did more of the English. So uh, working languages in the classes, English and French, but the languages in which uh, students were allowed to to specialize and in which they would be examined were uh, English and French and Spanish and German. No other languages were considered internationally uh, useful or suitable. Uh, and I humbly confess that when I thought uh, that that was not fair, because I had Portuguese and uh, Brazilian Portuguese, admittedly, but still. So I got Portuguese accepted, but it never even occurred to me that I could mention Polish, my mother tongue. That just, you know, and as far as I remember, uh, mother tongues, yes, uh, there was a, a Spanish a refugee girl, refugee from the uh, Franco regime. Uh, there was one uh, Maltese girl, and uh, it didn't occur to her that Maltese could be acknowledged. Uh, so she used French as a mother tongue, just as I did. Uh, we were taught, as I said, in this classroom, uh, the teachers brought a sort of recorder, something quite light, to set on the table, and it sort of played things to us, as far as I remember. And we practiced interpreting, uh, draping our coats or scarves or things over our heads so as not to disturb each other. Uh, and uh, one could just about be heard, and uh, one could get good advice about that, and uh, and we progressed as best we could, and then exam time came, and Jean Herbert, again, uh, was my examiner, uh, and uh, gave me extremely useful advice, and actually, with great kindness, uh, recommended uh, me for the first uh, conferences. Uh, luckily, Portuguese came in. It was a conference in uh, Lisbon about how many hundred years ago Henry, Henry the Navigator, Enrique o Navigador, had sailed from Lisbon. And so there I had an opportunity to work uh, from Portuguese, uh, and um, Jean Herbert was an extremely helpful uh, and very kind person, and his other advice, which uh, I remember now and try to convey to students, is that one should uh, learn to 
focused on essentials. This was a part of the consecutive approach to uh, interpreting. Uh, but uh, even in simultaneous, this may seem an old-fashioned point to make. Uh, one ought to set out what is essential. It is a matter of tone. It's a matter of conveying a message, not being a smooth little machine, uh, being a person. I think possibly it's a bit more difficult as technology gets uh, better. Uh, and it has certainly got very much better. Uh, but when I started, you had very few places where you could really work in simultaneous because very few rooms were equipped. Uh, in Paris, there was only UNESCO, the only building, not the current uh, very modern building. At the time I'm talking about the 50s, uh, UNESCO was still located in a hotel. Uh, and um, that was equipped with booths, and um, that was it. There was nothing else. Uh, if you wanted to work in Paris, uh, you worked as best you could. Uh, first of all, you had to find your clients. Uh, you had to telephone uh, all sorts of firms uh, and say, would you like some interpreting? Uh, I can do it. Uh, and how much will you charge? And of course, this gets me to, again, 1953, the birth of AIC. Uh, it's not just in my life with that course. Uh, it's in the history of interpreting that 53 is a big year, because it's the year when the AIC French Acronyms Association Internationale des Interprètes de Conférence, uh, it's still AIC, even though England uh, English is the lingua franca. Well, uh, there we are. So, Michel, it's the beginning of AIC. The um, profession is getting organized. And I'm thinking of the students in the booth here. And I know that they have all heard of Danika Sileskovic, obviously. And obviously, you met Danika. Uh, and then you... Um, became quite close to her as well. So uh, maybe you can tell students who she is and how you met her and how important she was actually for AIC. Yes, I'd love to do that. Um, in, in any event, the, the history of, of uh, AIC is so closely connected with the Seleskovic family. Uh, the founding figures were Danica and her brother Zoran. As their names indicate, you realize uh, their father was Serb, uh, so their mother had been French, but she had died young, and so they were largely brought up by their father. Uh, Danica uh, spent the war with her father in what was then Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, speaking Serb at home, uh, so her French was literally her mother's tongue and was her mother tongue. Uh, her uh, response to Yugoslavia was extremely different from that of her brother. And this, in a sense, affected the development of AIC. Uh, Zoran, her brother, joined the French Communist Party, uh, believed that AIC ought to develop as a trade union. Uh, and, for instance, uh, thought that it would protect workers and that uh, workers were freelance interpreters, whereas those who had staff positions in international organizations were civil servants. And therefore, he wanted AIC not to be inclusive. Uh, Danica, on the other hand, had entirely different political opinions and uh, didn't see uh, AIC as becoming uh, a trade union, did not see interpreters as being uh, 
divided into a proletariat and an exploiting class. Uh, and so the conflict between those two uh, viewpoints uh, underpinned the early days of AIC. Uh, it also reflected a certain resistance uh, in some uh, parts of the profession to the whole concept of, of AIC. Uh, at the time in London, there existed what was called LACI, the London Association of Conference Interpreters, which actually, uh, with some resistance, uh, allowed members, I was a member, uh, to join AIC, but never stopped existing. It's just that people gradually died out. I suspect, but I'm almost sure, that I'm probably, in all probability, almost surely the last person left who ever belonged to Lacey. A survivor again. Uh, so there you are. Uh, that was what was happening. Uh, in a way, it all links up with the difficulties of how to uh, actually work when uh, uh, when there are so few rooms equipped for simultaneous work. One of the ways one could do it was with so-called table sets, small machines, uh, which you could carry. There was one in the days of Lacey in London, uh, a small machine about as big as, well, as a typewriter, something like that, and you plugged it in. Uh, the machine was called, I don't know why, it's an English story. It was called Archie because apparently, before I ever came to England, there had been a BBC program about some funny character called Archie who was not a very hard worker. And of course, our Archie, I've traveled with it to conferences. It was renowned for not wanting to work. Uh, one had to plug it in lie down on the floor, hope there would be a kind delegate who would help and, and know where to kick the machine for it to start working. And so I, I, I had my troubles with, with Archie. Of course, if it wouldn't work, or delight, you could work in consecutive. Life was good again. So that's how it... Uh, proceeded towards the time, and I'm talking the 50s, of the 50s, even of the early 60s, when most of the work was inconsecutive. And a lot of it was uh, very much as part of the conference, because conferences lasted longer on account of the slowness of consecutive. They usually covered several days, and if there was a weekend, uh, some excursions, tours, and you are obviously part of them, uh, not that that was restful because uh, you are standing there uh, on the coach uh, translating whatever the driver was saying about the landscape and the history and all that. Uh, so uh, it was a, a demanding life, but as I said already, you were part of the team. Uh, you played a part uh, that had advantages, it had disadvantages. Increasingly, women occupied the interpreting position. Uh, I think there was a horrible word, feminization occurred. Uh, that had bad sides too one was often referred to as one of the girls, uh, not very dignified. Uh, and uh, I remember doing a conference in Edinburgh, and on the first page of The Scotsman, it was uh, about Scottish dairies, absolutely fascinating. There was a picture of the Dairy Queen, whoever she was, with female interpreter. I was a female interpreter. So 
I've been on the first page of the Scotsman. What more could one desire? Not a lot. <laughs> so, Michel, uh, I understand that you were using French, you were using English, you also mentioned Portuguese. So, when did you start using Polish and how did that happen? What part of your professional development brought Polish to, to the table? Well, um, I had um, been uh, doing the French booze uh, in the commission uh, after, only after uh, Portugal joined the European Union because there was a shortage of people with experience of interpreting and with some Portuguese. I started with that in the French booze after about a couple of years, 18 months, something like that. Uh, the uh, person who uh, dealt with us, uh, Madame Milo, known as Venus, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, rang me and asked if I would like to try the English booth. Of course I would. Who wouldn't? Uh, so, okay, B language, but I had a while in the English booth. And uh, there are problems with B languages. Uh, you know, one should remember words are not your masters, they are your servants. Victor Hugo said that. Uh, uh, he also added, if you call them, if you ring for them, they turn up. Well, uh, in a B language, they turn up a bit more slowly, which uh, is a problem, uh, obviously. But they did turn up, and so there I was. And by then, the world had changed again. And for once, it had changed for the better. Uh, Eastern Europe was then known as Central Europe, and it was becoming uh, increasingly democratic. And the preliminary discussions to the eventual admission of the former people's democracies to the European Union started. And uh, so uh, I uh, started with uh, out of Polish into French, in the French booth. Uh, and my, my first meeting with Polish delegates uh, started disastrously uh, because uh, I started with the Polish equivalent of uh, ladies and gentlemen um, and um, almost immediately I was in my first sentence or perhaps the second, the delegates marched out, both of them, and complained, uh, apparently. The next day, I was back in the booth. I was working in Polish. And during the break, I presumed to approach the Polish delegates and said, you know, I'm very worried about this. Because yesterday, your colleagues uh, obviously didn't like my Polish. Uh, and uh, they said, oh, that's all right, because well, they were the Ministry of Agriculture. They are peasants. They expect you to call them comrades and to use the and thou. Uh, but they said they were foreign affairs. And they said, um, don't worry. In a few years' time, everybody will speak like you do. And uh, well, they were so right. In other words, they will use the former modes of address. Uh, and so that was my humble beginnings out of Polish. And gradually, I reminded myself, after all, well, I always speak Polish at home. Uh, why not Polish booze? And I did a bit of it. Uh, that became my third and, I think, last uh, booze. Uh, it's, it's not so much my story. It's a story. Of, uh, of political change, not just of interpreting change. Uh, well, a change for the better, one hopes. So, Michel, um, you have spoken to us about uh, your life story, 
And I can see that it's an example of resilience. You have survived so many uh, obstacles in your life. Uh, you have um, managed to keep your languages uh, alive, especially your mother tongue. When you were no longer in Poland, you managed to add new languages. You managed to be in a new country, such as France, and add French you know, straight away. So nowadays, I'm thinking about the interpreters who are in the booth. They're always worried about their languages, what, sh what they should add, how they should maintain their, their language. I mean, you never lived in Poland after you, you left Poland. So how did you manage to keep your Polish alive? Um, and how about working with all these languages? How, what, do you have some advice to give to your to students nowadays? What would you recommend? Well, uh, how to keep one's language alive? Uh, basically, with Polish, uh, the idea was that one would uh, go back. We never went back. And so I never lived in Poland, except uh, short holidays now, staying in a hotel. Uh, during the war, it was... Uh, it was presumed we would go back. Uh, it was uh, obviously not advisable to speak uh, foreign tongues uh, outside um, the home, uh, but within the family uh, group, uh, my grandmother, uh, who was a small authoritarian figure, runs in the family. Uh, well, uh, she used to uh, insist on Polish being always spoken. Uh, she used to say, your father will come back from captivity and you will welcome him in French. Terrifying prospect. Well, I didn't welcome him in French when he came back. Uh, so Polish was kept alive. And after that, uh, well... After the war, uh, I tried to read Polish books. Uh, I always thought, perhaps someday, uh, and, and, and someday, one day, it even proved useful. But it was always, in a sense, uh, sentimentally useful to, to belong somewhere. Because when uh, you have so many alternative possibilities, you might end uh, without the sense that you belong anywhere. And so back to my first question in the underground. I know where I come from. Uh, and Polish helped with that. Other languages, advice to the students, <sighs> be careful about losing. It's more important not to lose than to add. I think that is essential. Keep your language uh, right. Mm. And if you add, <laughs> well, try to at least like it. Don't add it just because it'd be useful. Add it because it kind of meets some, uh, some liking, some predilection, uh, or it proves something. Uh, I think... For me, in the case of, of Portuguese, which I need not have added, and which really did turn out useful, but I never thought would be that useful, uh, I thought it had something to do with uh, the largely inaccurate idea that, uh, that in Brazil uh, all people were equally welcome without too much attention to the exact shade of their skin. Uh, it's not quite true. And, uh, and foreign affairs or for the Navy uh, is definitely preferable to be white. Uh, uh, but uh, it was a sort of reaction to the, uh, to the color prejudice thing. And, uh, and it, 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 struck, it struck me a bit uh, because uh, when I was in Brazil for a couple of years, people uh, who met me and my father used to say, oh, such a pity. And I used to say, what is a pity? And, uh, well, he had 
fair hair and blue eyes, which, of course, I never did. Um, and as I used to say, such a waste of blue eyes. Uh, it struck me as a strange, uh, vaguely racist, because one was very sensitive in those days to racist uh, attitudes. So to compensate, I sort of decided to uh, improve Portuguese, to learn Portuguese, and uh, it helped me to get into the booth, French booth first, uh, in the European Commission. And uh, I was aware that Brazilian isn't quite Portuguese. So I went to see the head of the new Portuguese booth and uh, asked him how he thought I would manage. He said, oh, I'm sure you'll manage fine. But you know something? You better not speak Portuguese too much. I said, why? Is it so bad? He said, oh, it's not that it's bad. It's a bit, well, it's a bit like like a black Brazilian. And of course it was, <laughs> because that's how I picked it up. So uh, at the back of my mind, this sort of race thing was there. Uh, and, and I would advise students, uh, if they had a language, to have a, a good reason other than purely commercial, economic, uh, let there be something about that language that uh, not only that you will speak, but that it will speak to you. I've got a, a final question for you, Michelle, and I think here we talked a lot about um, your life um, in the early days. We talked about interpreting quite a lot, your career as an interpreter, and I cannot stop myself thinking about the recent waves of migrants that have moved you know, from a, a number of countries to Europe. And we know that migration right now is not an easy question to discuss. We also know that migrants have been on the road for, to look for a better life or a safer future. You were in this particular situation when you were quite young. You were fleeing to find a safe haven in a sense, a place where you could live and prosper in a sense, you know, simply get an education, find work, find a place to live. How, I mean, how can you, how can you identify yourself with this, with this new people coming to Europe right now? How do you feel about it all? Can you see your own story being repeated? Um, what, what do you think of the future? What, what is going to happen? Do you have any thought about that? Because I know for you, you always feel as a refugee, we work together, we've been together for quite a number of years, and for you, I know that you often say, I am a refugee, I feel like a refugee. So can you maybe, for the final aspect of our conversation, talk to us a little bit about that? Not an easy point to tackle. Uh, yes, I do identify very much with refugees, uh, with the people who are getting away from uh, terrorism, war, attacks, uh, people who are endeavoring to survive. Uh, I feel slightly less sympathetic to those who uh, just think life will be easier elsewhere. Uh, yet, uh, easier, that is all uh, relative, and we do not know perhaps how very difficult survive was, is, where they come from. Uh, so uh, perhaps being a, a refugee on a purely economic uh, rather uh, than political grounds, maybe I have slightly less sympathy for that. I, I identify less. But that perhaps, in a way, uh, I think of our reasons for moving as being more 
imperative, but surely uh, hunger, extreme poverty, total deprivation uh, are strong motives. And, and I admit that I may not realize that enough. This is the penalty for being, in a sense, uh, still privileged. Uh, and perhaps uh, Brazil helps with that. Perhaps just being white uh, is a privilege in, in the world, so it ought not to be. Uh, certainly being European is a privilege. Uh, perhaps less so nowadays. Let's not start talking about the United States. Uh, of course, um, I must remember this is your final question. Uh, given time, uh, we could go on and on. Uh, going on is not just about showing that one can. So after a certain age, one should demonstrate, if only to prove to the young that survival is possible and that age is not ultimately always disastrous. Uh, that's a useful thing to do, I hope. Uh, but the other reason, well, is that uh, one ought to identify with what one has not experienced oneself, but it isn't easy. It's a question of imagination rather than memory. And uh, one cultivates memory, refugees do, uh, perhaps one should try and cultivate imagination a bit more. And that's what I would kind of give as advice. Try to put yourself in other people's place. Uh, it's not easy, but it might be a good thing. Thank you so much, Michel. I think today you really helped us trying to feel what it was like to be in your shoes uh, when we moved across, you know, and from the early days of your life, you know, to where you are today. Uh, it's a real privilege to hear your story. We've known each other for quite a long time, many years, and I never get tired of listening to you. You're an inspiration to us all. We hope that this recording will also uh, be an instrument to share your stories to so many other people, interpreters or not. So I think that today we are lucky, we are the privileged ones to be able to be here in the same room as you and to listen to you, to listen to your life. Uh, an example of resilience, uh, today we may think that you know, it's not easy for new interpreters, it's not easy to be um, part of the young generation, uh, but you have demonstrated to us that resilience is definitely the key word to succeed and to move forward. So I think I'm going to follow your recommendations and use my imagination mm -hmm. to see what other, people, other people's lives are, what they're going through, and embrace the challenge of continuously meeting others, uh, connecting with others, and sharing their life stories like we did with you today. So Michel, thank you so much for this particular, for this very special opportunity to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, interpreter. I think Michelle deserves a big round of applause. You know, fantastic. When you watch the video, you can say, I was there, you know, I was interpreting.